Um, what sort of reaction have you had here? Because it, it became much more international than you ever imagined. It's, I know it's kind of amazing. I was saying this yesterday because I've, I've been working on this story for 18 months. And so for 18 months, Cambridge Analytica was just my private personal obsession, which was very much outside the mainstream and nobody knew about. And so to come to a foreign country and a place and people are just talking about Cambridge Analytica as this is like a normal thing in the world. And I still find that sort of slightly amazing that actually it is out there now. I've got to remove that. Ah. I'm your stylist as well oh, today. Um, just tell us about Cambridge Analytica then as a company, because still I don't think people fully understand what it is and how it operated. And it's kind of, it's very complex and weird because Cambridge Analytica is a company that was set up by Robert Mercer, who's a hedge fund billionaire, who was the biggest uh, financial donor to Donald Trump. And he worked with Steve Bannon, who's the editor of Breitbart, and who was the vice president of this company. And they set it up using all of this harvested, illicitly harvested Facebook data. But the company's even more interesting in that than that because it came out, it was spun out of a parent company called SCL that is a military contractor and has had 30 years' work doing psychological operations and information warfare for governments in Britain, in the US, all around the world, and, and including for NATO. So it's this very weird, um, very up-to-date, cutting-edge technology which has been allied to military strategy and then turned on a domestic populations in two of these incredibly pivotal elections that we saw in 2016. So where did you first start on this story? What was it that tipped you off or what you found? What got you interested? It was, so it was this, um, it was shortly after Trump got elected. It was this dark and stormy night and I'd started researching fake news and I was just looking at Google and how Google worked and I stumbled across this set of um, really troubling Google searches. So I was typing just controversial terms into Google and I typed Jews into the search bar and I'd made it into a question and so I put R Jews and I got this suggestion from Google. Mm. It gives you these auto suggestions mm. and it said, are Jews evil? And I was like, what kind of question is that? And so I pressed the return bar and I got this whole page of results which was Nazi websites. It's all Nazi. It all said, yes, Jews are evil. And I was like, this is kind of crazy. What's going on here? And then I searched lots of other terms, and I found the same thing across all these other search terms. So the Holocaust I was putting in, and it was like, the Holocaust didn't happen. That was what the search terms we were getting. So it was this, it was this and I was like, what on earth is going on? And then I found this academic in America. And we had this late-night telephone call the, the next night, and he started mapping these fake news websites, and he found that they were all linked together. And by linking together, they were sort of drowning out the mainstream sources of news and information. So sources like The Guardian or like Expressen, they were being sort of swamped by this fake news network. So at the time, we were thinking of fake news as like little distinct articles, and he was like saying, no, 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 no the media have got this all wrong, it's a network, it's a network and it's growing and it's becoming stronger and it's kind of like a cancer which is taking out the ordinary mainstream source of news and information. And he said to me, who's the first person who said, he said, and there's companies like Cambridge Analytica. And I said, who are Cambridge Analytica? And he said, well, it's this company who worked for the Trump campaign and they work for the Leave campaign in which Britain. Which they argue... About, well, this was when it got very interesting. So I put this in, and he said, you know, they can track you around the internet using these fake news websites, using cookies they put in your computer. And they learn about your behavior. And from learning about your behavior, they then learn how to target you. And they can target you personally with kind of individuated propaganda just directed at you. And, um, Did and you understand any of this technology? No, I was like, what are you talking about, <laughs> This is crazy. Yeah. And, and I was like, what, what, what world are we in? But anyway, I wrote this first article about Google, and you know, which cre created a lot of fuss. But in it, I put that Cambridge Analytica worked, you know, we worked for the Trump campaign and worked for Brexit in the UK. And, and then it was all kicking off. I had Google like issuing legal threats and saying there was, wasn't a problem and refusing to change. This. So this was all going on. And then, but then I started getting letters from Cambridge Analytica 
going, um, you know, dear sir, la 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 la, your false report, we never worked on Brexit. And for all, I was, so the reader's editor said, okay, we need to issue a correction or whatever. And, and I was like, well, this is all over the internet. It says that they worked on Brexit. Here's the CEO, Alexander Nix, sort of saying we've been hired by the Leave campaign. And here's the Leave campaign's website saying we hired Cambridge Analytica. So what are they talking about? And, and this, is th this was like literally the sort of the start of the journey, which sort of got me to here, really. It was they picked the fight first. This is what, when I met Alexander <laughs> Nix, the CEO, I was like, Alexander, you picked the fight with me in this one. So, um, uh, What was their tactic with you to try to suppress the story, do you think? Uh, I mean, it was all sorts of different tactics. So um, initially, what they did was just completely ignored me. I was putting in multiple press requests. And um, they refused to answer questions. They refused to offer anybody to an interview. But then when I did this first big story on them in February last year, they um, actually, they, they, they still, they just started complaining at that point. And it was when I did the second story in May last year, which was the first one I did with Christopher Wiley, the guy with the pink hair who came forward as the whistleblower. He, first of all, was an anonymous source for my article. And it was after that one they started trying to sue us. And so they used, um, you know, very intimidating legal threats to try and suppress the story. And they did make it very difficult. And so it, one of the reasons why it took so long to actually come forward and get Christopher Wiley on the record and publish this spring was to do with that, that landscape where they were threatening to sue us if we wrote anything more about it. And he then went on the record with various media organisations explaining how it worked. So just, if you can, explain how the system there worked. Um, obviously, we have to be careful about the fact that they're always denying a lot of this. Well but no, Chris worked in there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Chris, Chris was this, you know, he was very young, very talented, very um, techie, and he'd worked in politics. He's kind of like one of these sort of child prodigy types, really. And um, he had been the one who'd come up with the idea for it really he was the one who sort of had seen this research about how from gathering people's data just their likes of things what the things they'd liked on facebook you could then from this extrapolate things about people's personalities about their hopes and fears about their hopes and fears and their and things you know and, and, and things they were worried about mm. and then work out how to target them as the basis of that so chris had come across this research He'd got this job at the company and he'd come across this research and he approached these academics from Cambridge University and said, hey, we want to get hold of this Facebook data. We'd like to do this. Um, can you help? And, um, and one of them, they found this guy, Alexander Kogan, and he said, sure, I can go out and just by targeting a few hundred thousand people, we'll pay. A with a questionnaire? With a questionnaire. We just have to pay a few hundred thousand people, a couple of dollars each, to do a questionnaire. And then we get access not just to their profiles, but we're going to get access to all their friends' profiles as well. So all these people had no idea. They just happened to be friends. A distant friend, one of your, uh, somebody on Facebook, had taken a personality quiz. And on the back of that, this <laughs> military contractor doing this, wi owned by this very ideologically motivated billionaire had got hold of all of their personal Tens information. Tens of millions of pieces yeah. of information. Y yeah. But the academic denies that he was complicit though, right? He, he, he was doing this as part of his own research already and then passed it on to Cambridge Analytica. He had, well, he had permission to gather this data for academic, academic purposes. purposes. But are you saying the agreement about and the he survey yeah, was done so, before? So, so he gathered the information on that basis but then he sold it for commercial yes. reasons, and that was the um, that was the really problematic thing. And Facebook, of course, they I mean they they tried so many sort of strategies to sort of shut this story down and to discredit it. And one of the things they did was just completely blame Kogan. They were sort of scapegoating other people. Now it was you know Kogan did not act well. Cambridge Analytica did not act well. But also Facebook, uh, you know, just. Facebook refused to, to own up to what happened here. And um, it, this was first reported in The Guardian in December 2015. And they've managed to ignore it and, and not give any answers and refuse to accept it's a problem until this spring. 
when we had Christopher go on the record about it. And then Facebook went all the way with it, basically, and have changed all their agreements. They're talking about regulation of Facebook, which they haven't accepted before. We're seeing, you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg out in the media. He's been on CNN, which he you know, doesn't do these interviews. And it's all off the back of your reporting. But, I mean, how would you sum up the, the total impact? And also, they're, 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 they're filtering now, aren't they, um, political messaging and making sure that that doesn't get online or if it is, it's labelled properly. So, it's, I mean, it's kind of, I mean, it's been amazing to watch because... We all, you know, we knew that Cambridge Analytica were in trouble. We always knew this was going to have an effect on their business. But we really, really underestimated the impact on Facebook. And to be honest with you, what was kind of so pleasing about it was that Facebook really brought it upon themselves. Because they si tried so desperately to shut the story down, they tried to sue us the day before publication. And then they tried, so they threw Cambridge Analytica off the, 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 the evening before we published. It, was, it tried to discredit Christopher Wiley. It tried to discredit Kogan. And everything it did just made the story bigger and, and the impact worse. And so it's, you know, it's, it, there are lots of things which are good. It's good that like Mark Zuckerberg got dragged before Congress. But there's still, it's the tip of the iceberg. It really, really is. And, uh, you know, they spend a huge amount of money on PR, on lobbyists, on protecting their interests. And we have to be alive to that and realize that, you know, these are the most... Uh, they're, they're so, you know, these are, this is it's one of the most powerful companies in the world. It's not accountable. It's, we, we, can't, we can't call it, to, you know. So let me give you an example. The British Parliament has asked Facebook to come and answer questions about what its role was in the referendum, and it's refused. It hasn't. It's offered a lower-level executive it, well, it's the one offered that they three, wanted. We've had, three, we've had two lower-level executives, but they, just, they aren't giving us the answers. And um, they, Facebook, they keep on going, yes, going forward, we're addressing all these problems, but they're, also, they're just refusing to, to, to acknowledge and to address what happened in the past. And for us, that's the referendum. So we have got no idea um, what adverts were shown to which people and who paid for them and what impact they had and how people were targeted during the referendum. We don't know if it was legal. We don't know how much money was overspent. And it's incredibly frustrating that that, that information is on Facebook servers. And it's the same with the Trump Russia investigation. There's all sorts of information that is on Facebook servers and it's not being transparent and accountable and it's not responding to the demands from parliaments around the world. And, you know, let's not be fooled by this kind of like, oh, we're so sorry and we're going to do all this stuff. It's not enough. And, 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 and uh, th this is, you know, why we need these tech companies to be regulated by law. This is really important. Uh, the Swedish defence minister was describing to me how there's fake news now going in the run-up to the Swedish election this year. Um, and it's a real problem because he thinks a lot of it is coming from the you know, populists, but also perhaps from Russia as well. Just describe to me what you've learned about, you know, voter behaviour and sort of social media behaviour in terms of what they latch onto there and where the failure is. If you, ta if you take Facebook out of it and just accept that it's there, why are people latching onto it? What are the, what, what's happening here with fake news? Well, do you mean in terms of the Russian influence here? I think example? why why are people latching onto obviously fake stories quite often because we don't know they're fake and because the sort of say i was uh, you know saying is that if if we saw an advert which was which said we're the racists and we'd like you to believe in our racist policies and maybe you could do these racist things and vote for other race then we go oh you know what i think this might be fake news being put out by racists but they don't do that instead instead you'll get a news story about your local hospital being under threat and um and if you're concerned about local services, then you must realise that they're under pressure because of the enormous number of immigrants who are accessing these services above locals. And that will be presented as a, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a legitimate news article. And you won't realise that this is a political communication which is designed to disarm you and to, 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 to you know, persuade you of different um, uh, political viewpoints through this quite sort of subtle... Methods. Well, they're often expressing emotions, aren't they, that people feel? Yes, yes that's, that's right. And that's often enough for them to share it. It's an impulsive yes, thing. Yes, that's right. And we know that fake news travels wider and further than legitimate news because it's more exciting and because it's more, you know, they're using, they, as you say, they're using 
emotions to 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 scare people into action, and and then th these are mostly negative emotions, and um, so this is why sort of classic liberal parties around the world have uh, are just having a much tougher time of it. That's a much harder message to sell. Well, the liberal parties. Um, do you think the Swedish Liberal parties, for example, or more Liberal parties, even the two mainstream parties, should be engaging more with the populists on that basis and trying to bridge that gap in the, you know, on the mainstream media instead of allowing it to bubble up on social media? So that's one of the suggestions, that by not cooperating with populists, they're creating the division that um, outside powers can exploit. It's really hard, though, because it's sort of, you know, how do you fight? You fight lies with the truth. You know, that's one of the, 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 the really basic things in journalism. But we know that's not enough. We see how Donald Trump reacts to it. He's presented with fact-based, evidence-based reporting, and he just calls it fake news. So how do you counteract that? We're all in this really difficult conundrum. How do you, as the person researching fake news for the last however long? What's the answer? Is it regulation of social media companies it's so hard uh, i mean it's one of the things which it just sort of it's it, it's it one of the things which it did so one of the great things about doing this for me is it's made me i've worked in journalism for a long time and um it was sort of you know it was like journalism was a great way to inform people and entertain people and all the rest of it i really didn't see it as being on this sort of front line of you know our democratic societies and, and being part of the story and the things we the things we hold dear and now it just seems that it's just so important and the holding this line between lies and truth is down to um it's down to politicians and it is down to journalists and our world is under threat because the big platforms which are mediating this stuff also destroyed our business model and have made it harder to operate. And there's fewer journalists around now than there were 10 years ago. And um, that's, I, I don't know. I mean, we need to be more creative. We need people to come up with other solutions. But we also need to realize that we need to support independent journalism. And that's why Expressen, you know, what you're doing is so important. Swedish Radio, who invited me here. That's why it's so important that, um, you know, we just continuing trying to fight lies with truth. That's all we can do. Swedish Radio, Express and CNN, The Observer, The Guardian. Um, there's all these processes in place to make sure that stories are accurate, as you <laughs> have been through with your editors, right? You had to prove every single detail of your stories and your reporting. Do you think it's acceptable that much bigger organizations with a lot more money are allowing inaccurate pieces of journalism to exist? It's really, really problematic because you just get, uh, you know, websites like Breitbart will just print any old lies and then that gets picked up on social media and that, you know, assumes its own reality. And, um, and yeah, so we, we uh, uh, big news organisations do have like a real duty and responsibility here. So because one of the things we saw, for example, is the way that, you know, news organisations pick out they were picking out things off Twitter and off Facebook as like voice of the people of like, oh, so-and-so are reacting to things like this and they'd pick out tweets and things. And then afterwards, one of the things we discovered when it was exposed, the um, Internet um, Research Agency, which is the, the troll factory in, in, St. Petersburg. in St. Petersburg, which was putting out all these fakes, they had all these fake accounts. And we realised that completely legitimate news organisations were quoting from these troll accounts in their news reports. So, the, you know, it's just so messed up, the world that we're living in. And we're really only at the start of understanding, you know, what's going on and how, therefore, to counter it. Uh, is there a responsibility on the public as well, though, to get out of their bubbles and stop listening to the stuff that reinforces their view and perhaps, you know, follow accounts which take them out of their comfort zone. Yeah, so I follow lots of accounts now which take me very far outside yeah, of my comfort zone. But that's zone. what we need to be doing more of, right? So we're seeing, we're accepting more views. But social media has allowed us to stick in our own ghettos in a way. Mm, mm, yeah, that, and I think people w did suddenly become aware of that after that they were like, you know, especially after the Trump got elected, it was like, but, you know, and you had people saying, but nobody in my timeline was supporting him, I don't understand. And so, so, yes, like hearing other points of view, 
But it's just so, we know that it's so polarized at the moment. It's so extreme. So, and, and, and so many of these other points of views are just, you know, conspiracy theories put out by liars. So, yeah, we've got to listen to them, but... They've always been around, though, conspiracy theories, haven't they? But there's something about the legitimacy that's come with the digital age it gives. Yeah, and it's so interesting. So, like, the tactics that we know Russia use and will be presumably using in the Swedish election is that you don't just... M I, they adapt to every country and every situation and they just amplify the discontents that are already there in the country. So, um, and they just help to amplify it. And, and it's, it's mostly about amplifying discord uh, and polarising um, opinions and, and that has been really effective. And that divides a nation's authority, power? Is that what you, what's the impact of that? Well, it's just, it's just, it, it, it's everything becomes more divisive, uglier, more extreme, and and uh, uh, and this is where the extremist parties, the ones at the edges, are the ones that benefit from that. Really. Um, what are you working on now then? Does, does this continue this process, or have you finished this with Cambridge Analytica oh, as I it doesn't exist anymore? Uh, no, reporting. no, no, no. I I wish because you know I've I, uh, one of the, the 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 first things that I found out was this thing about how they worked in the referendum in Britain. Now, the referendum is our biggest vote in our lifetime. We're about to exit the European Union. And what I have discovered is that it's, it was this company was being used and its Canadian affiliate, and they had the most consequential impact upon the entire election. And um, there is... A, multiple breaches of electoral law that have occurred and um, it which has been mediated by these big tech companies who are refusing to answer our questions and um, it's I, I, I that vote was not free and not fair and we are going to go exit the European Union on a on a really 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 flawed election and so I'm very much keeping going in there are other points of view on that story well there's, there's <laughs> yeah, but it's a big accusation to make about the well, no, so I know, but I can tell you, I can tell you this morning. Okay, so a report has been leaked. We've got a report coming out into massive overspending by the official Brexit campaign, and that that has come out today. And that's not one report. There are multiple reports mm. because because there are multiple um, offences that are being investigated, and the latest one is. The latest one, which has not yet been investigated yet, but we've been reporting on for the last month, is about how the Leave campaign collaborated with Russian government officials and were being presented with... Which they deny. I'm just trying yes, to... Yes, which you know, deny. I don't want to get expressive they deny, but into no, a situation they, they, where sorry, we're accusing yes, the Leave I'm campaign sorry. of being complicit with Russian trolls. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we'll follow your reporting on that, <laughs> and I know it'll be edited very um, effectively. Did you ever think, as a journalist, you'd be... A fake news expert, ultimately. Uh, no, it's just completely crazy. So I'm a feature writer, and m my background is a. It's a um, I do, I've done lots of interviews and reportage and that kind of thing. And to spend a, a few weeks on a story was quite a luxury. To spend 18 months pursuing, <laughs> turning myself into an investigative reporter to follow this has been somewhere I did not expect to be. But then the world is in a place we didn't expect it to be. So. And now you're invited to Almadal and by Swedish radio. It's been great. Get to speak to us here at Express as well. Thank you very much. I'm going to... Carol, because everyone always gets her name wrong, which is terrible, isn't it? Uh, Cadwallader. Yes, perfect. Right. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much indeed. Tack. Thank you very much Tack for having me. <laughs>